Good afternoon everyone and welcome to uh, the next Doors Open Day film. And this is the last film that will be going out today before we go uh, on to another series of films tomorrow. And today, uh, um, for this talk, I'm welcoming Anne Fraser, who is our family historian. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of you will have been looking forward to this one, because I know it's a subject that a lot, a lot of people are interested in. No pressure, Anne. But I'll let Anne <laughs> here herself while I get the slides set up. Hello everyone, my name is Anne Fraser, as Lorna has alluded to, and I'm the family historian here at the Highland Archive Centre. And I'll just start by saying I just love my job. Huh. We, we will definitely touch on that. <laughs> as I've done with some of the other talks, just to put up a picture of Anne uh, there, because I'm aware that you'll have seen her very briefly and now will be tiny little pictures on your screen. So just so you can see who it is we're talking to, and Anne is there brandishing a copy of her book that she wrote, Lessons by Loch Ness, which is uh, a great example of using original archive material to tell the wider story of uh, family history and the history of an area. Yeah, and that's my area, that's south side my, of Loch Ness. Absolutely, the, <laughs> the place that you're passionate about. It's interesting when I've spoken with various members of staff to do this, uh, one thing that really comes across is their passion for particular subjects or particular places. Yeah, uh, and I know you're you're one of those people as well. Yeah, absolutely. I just yeah. So I wrote that book actually. Ooh, 2014 it was. So that's a few years ago now. Yeah, absolutely. And um, now one thing before we go any further, we've got your name and title listed as family historian, and I know that's something you probably want to touch on the difference uh, as you see it between a family historian and a genealogist. Well, yeah, genealogy really is sort of just the bones of a family tree where you're finding out names and dates and hopefully places as well that um, dates of birth and dates of death and marriages all happened. But I'm more interested in the family history as well and trying to encourage others to get dig deeper and to add flesh to the bones and find out you know, what was happening in history at the time um, of their ancestors, their, their lives like in the 1840s, they could have been through the potato famine and different um, things that were happening um, and um, just generally looking up archive records and obviously for the Highlands uh, we have these within the Highland Archive Centre so it's rather than just looking at online resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah well as we were, we've said previously you would never describe your own parents as a list of dates you know. No absolutely you, not. You would they talk were, about their job or their yeah their, they their were, passions. Or... Yeah they were real people living real lives. Yeah absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned there uh, that you're based in the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness, but you've got a wider Highland remit than that, haven't you? So you can cover uh, a much wider geographical base than uh, that. Well, wider as in the whole of Scotland yep. and <laughs> England and perhaps other places as well. So, um, yes, not just Highland. I will yep. research for other areas too. But um, the beauty is that within the Highlands, at least I can access the original resources here yeah. um, that are not available online. If for instance, here we've got school records, uh, we've got uh, Kirk Session records, we've got Presbytery records, and there's so many more records that are not available online as yet. So Yes, that add to the story. Absolutely. And you're usually to be found uh, in and around this room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Room. Yeah. Um, so maybe not so much during COVID-19, but we're, we have got quite a lot of visitors normally, and yeah. uh, I like to help them to find um that find that they can actually walk in their ancestors footsteps um and um i love helping them as well and discovering information for them many of them as well will then commission me to do um some family history research and also um, draw up a family tree and i think that's one of my favorite parts of the job is actually compiling the family trees there's something nice about being able to see it visually all laid out isn't yeah. there and you get to yeah. see the generations going back and going sideways and mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. something uh, and that's yeah like. and even yeah even finding out their occupations I think that's great as well just to see what did they actually do and where did they live yes yeah occupations are something everybody's always fascinated by aren't they all the ones that you don't you don't get anymore or yeah <laughs> sometimes exactly. when you get it and you have to go and look up what it means <laughs> what is that yes right <laughs> so this is a phrase you've already used walking in, in your ancestors footsteps. Mm. So how how did you get into this job and, and why are you passionate about it? 
Well, I suppose in a way it was it was a hobby years ago, um, and it was when my uncle showed me a, a book that um, himself and my mother were in, and that was the book of the McCrimmons, because we were descended from Ian Du McCrimmon, who was one of the best known pipers than Sky. Um, and the stone there that I found in Dunvegan Churchyard, which is actually where Ian Du is, is uh, buried as well, but this stone is for one of my un other ancestors, which I thought was an amazing stone to find. Mm, elaborate, somebody. yeah. Well, very elaborate for somebody who was probably free church. Yes. Uh, and it has Celtic drawings on it and things like that. Um, I was quite amazed to find that one. Um, and the other picture, that's a picture of my great grandmother with her oldest son, Donald. And um, sadly, I'd find out he died at the age of six, but adding a bit more flesh to the bones, I discovered that at the age of six, he is mentioned in the Aldowdy School logbook that we have here um, when he died and telling about um, a party of boys putting money towards um, um, a floral tribute and also going to his funeral. And that just added even more to the story than just seeing a death certificate for him. There's something very emotional about that. Yeah. Uh, about seeing the wider impact that that death mm -hmm. had on the community. Absolutely. That it, that it was a big, a big enough note, just not just to the family, but to the wider community to be noted somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, kind of testifies so, to a life. So I never knew him, and actually my dad never knew him either. He died before my dad was born. Okay. Although yeah. he was my dad's brother. But it's something you, you feel passionately about, don't you, about people um, connecting to their own past. Yeah, absolutely yes yeah and we have a lot of people who come in to all of our offices but who who really want to be connected to the past to the highlands or be able to link their family back to yes to and men, many i've managed to get back quite far as well mm -hmm. um you know a lot of people come in here maybe want to get back to find somebody that was in culloden which managed to do on the odd occasion it's you know, we don't often manage that. Or back to Robert the Bruce, I haven't managed that uh, quite a few times as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some people are just thrilled. But, you know, one lady I remember came in here because um, she just showed me a gravestone. Uh, no, she, I found a gravestone for her. That's what it was. Um, she wanted to find out where somebody was buried. And I'd never heard such a reaction of now I can die happy having found this. Um, but there's lots of emotions going through lots of people as they're looking into their family history. It's an interesting thing, and I've, this has come across when I've spoken to different members of staff about how much they feel it's it can be a life changing experience for people connecting with their own past or with the past yes. of family, whether that's through poor relief records or through mm. finding a person that they've been trying to connect, you know, trying to find a record of, yeah. can have a, a big impact on people. Absolutely, I agree. Um, yeah, it, it can change their lives some way. I do have um, warnings attached to um, doing Indeed. your family history as well. <laughs> I usually think it should be a government health warning attached to it because you can get hooked on this. Um, <laughs> I'm sure anybody I, watching will testify to that if yeah. they're interested. But my other um, warning to people is it's like doing a jigsaw without any edges <laughs> because it never comes to an end. You know, some people think, I, I, you know, I want to finish my family history. There is always something else to find out. Yeah, yeah. So one of the questions <laughs> that I know we get asked a lot and whenever I have, have been working in that, the family history room, one of the things people say often is, how do I start this? Okay. What's the easiest answer? <laughs> well, the easiest answer is you always start with yourself. You know, who am I? Um, and that really is the first place to start. I've, I've uh, helped people who have been adopted as well. Um, you know, so where do they start? They have to start with themselves. Um, and speaking to family um, relatives, really, especially older ones, just to see what information they've got. And then you really have to start with statutory records. Births, deaths and marriages is the place to begin. Um, and getting places and dates and always note down absolutely everything you find because you might think the information is not relevant but it will be one day. And so, where you found it. Yes exactly yes. <laughs> so There's nothing more annoying than going back trying to find it and you can't remember where you found it. 
Yeah. There was one lady who always says, talk about it. Don't mind you talking about me, although I'll never give her name away, who came in she, and um, she just wanted to find out who she was. Um, but all she had was she was adopted um, and she believed she had a sister. And, you know, from there, we built a picture. She was in her 70s at this point, And um, we found that sadly her sister had died at the age of five. But that led me to other records discovered her own mother had um, remarried and she actually had a brother that she found, a half brother. And then amazingly, we found her mother's sister um, not too far from here. And she came back to visit me with photographs when she found her mother's sister and then went back a year later or something like that to celebrate her aunt's 100th birthday. Oh, and they were wonderful. just so alike. And yeah. her aunt had said when she walked in, we always knew one day that you would find us. So, so yes, what you know because it's the only that what you know about yourself is the easiest thing to prove, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And start um, generally with one side of the family, or yes, yes I would. I yes, I would encourage that. And if you're just beginning, I would actually say um, start with the easiest side, the father's yeah. side. No, the, the, the easiest side, oh, for your, I see, yes. you know, which one is, you know, which one perhaps, you know, if it was the Highlands, for instance, the one that is Highland, maybe the not such a, a common name as perhaps Fraser or MacDonald, if there yes. is, you know, um, a name that will be easier to discover. Um, okay. Or I would even suggest come to my family history a class for beginners. Yeah, we'll we will touch on your family history <laughs> okay. class for beginners. <laughs> OK, another one we get asked a lot about. So are there useful resources yeah. or websites that you would point people to uh, to yeah. start out with? Um, I would start with Scotland's people. If, if they we're talking about Scottish records, I would start with Scotland's people. And um, the beauty of the Highland Archive Centre here is that we have the Scotland's people network here. Um, and I would advocate coming here for a day once it opens um, again, to, because it's, it's uh, easier to find them here. You can work on Scotland's people online, but there are cut-off dates for births. There's 100 years, marriage is 75, and deaths 50. So you can't see anything more recent than that. And and that's a, a government-run website, isn't it? So it's, it's managed and run by the government. So there's no kind of uh, potential for, for confusion with records it, being added it, in there. Yeah, Exactly. Yes, that's the thing, which is the difference if we think about ancestry, um, because people can put trees in there that you know we don't know if it's right you then have to research that as well it's very useful to find some people um, and find yes, my past. pointers yeah absolutely yes and I certainly use them both every day as well yeah okay this is a common one so people <laughs> often will say to us uh, no no that can't be my McDonald's my McDonald's are spelt with an a or without an a um, no, that's <laughs> fine. We we use them all and you'll find in the one record, perhaps for a birth entry, and the person's name is spelled MC and their parents are MAC. So it's a preference. It was usually the preference of whoever was recording the information, because perhaps the people themselves who are giving the information can't spell. Um, so it's the preference in, in the old parish records um, of Session Clark. So you know, there's, just there's lots of completely yeah. interchangeable. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and some people thought MC was Irish and MEC Scottish. No. OK. Yeah. And I think you you were saying to me once that with Fraser, even Fraser, you'd found so many different spellings with oh, Z absolutely. and I's and S-H. And yeah. <laughs> so, I know. And that's that's the, the good thing with Scotland's people, that you can do fuzzy matching or put in asterisks to cover different ways of spelling. So. Uh, for instance, McDonald, I would do M asterisk, D O N asterisk, L asterisk. And that is because McDonald could be marked an L as well. Or yeah. Mac D O N D. You know, it's. Yes. And so, it's the same with first names, isn't it? If you have like Robert as an abbreviation yeah. or John or. Yeah, absolutely. John, I would do J asterisk, O asterisk, because um, further back in time, John can be J N O. Yeah, yeah. So these are all the tricks that Anne knows. <laughs> it's not all the tricks. I'm still Anne. learning. <laughs> Even after, what, nearly 30 years, I'm still learning. <laughs> takes time and practice and you, and you uh, are practicing regularly. So you've touched on this a bit already, but 
why with all these amazing resources that are available online, why are original archives still important for family historians? I think they're vitally important because um, you know, nobody else has accessed them perhaps. You know, they're, they're, they're just not out there and they need to be looked at. Um, don't leave any stone unturned. Um, and because they're original and handwritten, some of them might be very difficult to read, but there are so many other records rather than birthdays, marriages to look at, um, just even to just find out about the people and what they lived through, etc. And I know certainly in, in the archive search room where I have worked, we you you have that moment where somebody finds a connection to say they had an ancestor who was in the town council or something, and they might just get to find something in their writing um, mm -hmm. or with a signature in it. And that means Absolutely. a lot to people as well. It's not maybe giving them any information, but it's giving them a connection to the person. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. You can find out much more about them. Yeah. And the context, as you say, of what's happening round about the time and in the town and things like yeah. that. Exactly. Yeah, very much so. The last one I thought to put on here that might be uh, of interest to people is sometimes people say, oh, but my mum did our family tree, you know, years ago. Like, for instance, for me, my granddad started my family tree. Yeah. But when I when I looked at his notes, there's things like, you know, write to the office in the borders and ask them if this is the same person because they were getting someone down there to trawl through yeah. birth records for him. There's so always the something new to discover. Um, I could tell you so many stories about that. But can I just say a most recent one, even in my own family, and I'm sure the lady won't mind me saying this, was just about two weeks ago when I had um, somebody who emailed me looking for a certain person's death um, who died in the parish of Gerloch. Um, and I sent that she wanted to know what he died of. So I sent that information to her. But um, this, I am doing more work for her because I discovered that actually she's a cousin and um, she is, her great grandfather was a half brother of my grandfather. Huh. Who I never, no, my great, my great grandfather, who I never met. Okay. Obviously. Um, and I hadn't gone down that line huh. because so, yes, I, had, if, I didn't know he'd gone to England and then came back up here and died here. So if so, you're still uh, discovering new information, other well, I, people yes, will. <laughs> yes, because I knew I had his death. I knew that. But I didn't know he'd got, gone down to England and got married and come back up here. And over the years, there's been such such a transformation in the amount of information available, hasn't there? In terms yes. of, yeah. of what you can find online and what you can, uh, exactly. who you can contact. Yes, it's so much more. It's, yeah, it's, it's in, a, in a way, it's so, so much easier. It's given us more to look at. But um, yeah, and in lots of other ways, you've really got to research it because, you know, you can go down a wrong line. So you have to be very careful and double check lots of um, resources. Yes, cross-reference everything. At all time. Reference everything, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I should say that to everything, shouldn't I? I know. Do you know, when I've been doing these Learn with Lorna talks, I've said that so many times. Just like, yes. So just double check it. Just double check oh, the information. Totally, totally. Oh, the, you wanted to talk about a couple of the stories that, that, that had come to you in unusual ways. So. OK, so yes, because normally people are coming to us with their name or their parents or grandparents names and it's names that we start with. But I love how sometimes we're actually um, looking at objects. And in this case, this is when I worked with Inverness Royal Academy and Inverness Museum. And we were looking at um, items from World War One. And in this case, this is a death penny. And all it said was the name of the person, um, which was John Cameron. And there was another one to Alexander Cameron, who, you know, we just that's all we had. Apart from the fact um, it was a lady's name, Isabel Cameron, who'd handed them into the museum years before. And but, these are pennies that are issued to the, the families of people who have to the, been yeah, they're given to the relatives of somebody who died during the First World War. Um, and but who were they? So I'm glad to say we did actually manage to find out who they belonged to, where they lived. And and a very, very sad story surrounds that one. It's particularly nice when it's been somebody who has, you know, who's obviously fought and died for their country to try and regain some of that story so that that yeah. memory isn't lost of what they, exactly. what they gave. Yeah. 
Um, so this was the story, um, the story of the Bible. Um, a, a <laughs> we don't have time for the whole story of the Bible. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> a, a gentleman <laughs> got in touch with me from America saying that he, he had this Bible that it said inside, I think you can just see it, Mr. Is it Alex McDonald, I can't remember now, is it Muerton Street? Yes, Muerton Street, yeah. yeah. Inverness, and I think the year was in the 1860s sometime, and he said, could you find out um, answer, uh, descendants of this person, and so I can give them this Bible, and I thought, Alexander MacDonald in Inverness, great, but anyway, we find out who he was, and we find out his family, we found out, in fact, that his son even had archives here too, um, so that was really interesting, and managed to uh, find somebody in Glasgow who was descended from him, and um, he was he was given the Bible. He actually came up to us on one of our doors open days. One um, of our normal doors open days. Normal doors open days, yes. Last year, there was, he said there was even a, a four leaf clover inside the Bible as well. And he uh, took it up with him. And, and that was that was a good story, you know. And that, was a, that was an example, actually, of um, talking about the, the finding somebody's name in other records, because yes. If I'm if I'm right in remembering this, it was his son who was Kenneth MacDonald, Kenneth, who was that's right. mm -hmm. the town clerk. Well, yeah. And so the family had come in and seen his writing in the Town Council minutes. And yes. that's just something additional to, to know that that existed. Oh. And probably without the Bible being chasing them down, they wouldn't have had cause to know that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's lovely. Yeah. Here's our fabulous Here's colleague, Debbie. 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 Yeah. So this is a gentleman who came to me with a sword he discovered. It was a real sword, not a replica. And because it had the Wilkinson sword number and it discovered that it belonged to a Mr. R.S. Fraser. There was a lot of Frasers about, but thankfully there's not many R.S. Frasers. So we actually discovered who he was, Richard. And um, we also found out he died in Inverness, quite a young age, actually. And um, his family had a Bancrew House Hotel which was Bangkok House at the time. Yes. So just some some of the various ways people will come to you and say, I've got this thing and I want to know more about who owned it. And again, that adds exactly to what you were saying, that people are more than just a list of dates. You know, yes. these people had a sword or a Bible or... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I had asked you to uh, pick a story that was one of your favourite ones. <laughs> Oh, this is about. definitely one of my favourite. I mean, I've done so many talks on uh, Ambrose and it was, uh, you know, is, there is a mystery sound surrounding it. Um, so Dean Owens, singer-songwriter, had written this song um, about his grandmother, Dora, but it is a verse in it somewhere back there. There's a lion tamer, Ambrose and his dancing bear, he's buried in the highlands, but we're not sure where. And Judy, one of her managers, had been um, listening to this song and went to speak to Dean afterwards and said, you might not know where he's buried, but I know who to ask to find out where he's buried. And um, long story short, um, we obviously found that he was actually buried in Tom Nehurich. Um, I was speaking to folks who work up at Kilvane and they said it's the most visited gravestone in Tom ah. And his family tree is vast because there are still people coming into the Highland Archive Centre saying, we're descended from Ambrose Salvona. Oh, well, here's his family tree. It's not often that happens that we can say, here's your family tree. If yes, you come we've done it already. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, but I have, I've gone down lines of all his children, which were quite a few. And also um, he there was records in the, in the poor house because he was there, he died there. And a lot of people, you know, died there or, or were born there, not because they were poor, but because they got free um, medical help um, when they weren't well. So, you know, some people think, oh, no, they were, you know, in the poor house, but it could be for other reasons that they were there. Um, but he was on his own up here. His family weren't. And it's quite a sad story in a way. Um, and we've discovered lots of things. There's more mysteries around it, uh, but we have found lots. And continuing to find it more, I think every time I give the talk on Ambrose, I have found just a little bit more and that's quite exciting too. It's interesting when I, I spoke to Jennifer, one of our archivists, and I spoke to Richard and Carrie, our conservators, and one of the things they were all saying was how you can become very much entwined with a document or a story or mm -hmm. an object um, and you probably are the person who knows most about it. And I, I think that's probably the same with something like this. You're probably the person now who knows most about this this man's life. 
<laughs> probably. <laughs> um, it's an amazing thing to think about, isn't it, that you become I so know. involved. I know, but I, I'm sharing it. I think I'm sharing just about everything. <laughs> you are sharing it, but you know what I mean? You, you, yes. It's amazing that you should have that privilege of being so intimately um, involved with somebody's life who yes. died 100 years ago. Exactly. And, and actually, 100 years after you died, we had a, a whole lot of members of the family up here. I give the talk. And what we found out about him was he was Salvation Army. And I worked out from what I had read about him that the Salvation Army would have um, had a procession going from um, the castle to Tom McHurich, um graveyard with them. And uh, we finished up with that a hundred year, exactly 100 years after he died. And the Salvation Army came and we marched from here up to the gravestone. And that for the for his descendants apparently was a very emotional time. Yeah. Again, it's um validating a life, isn't it? It's acknowledging that someone's life was important and that that we remember it and will treasure, you know, we treasure the people who are in our records, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um so just finally before I go. Mm. You've got mm. classes coming up if people are interested in taking part. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't got to finalise the date yet because I'm hoping that this will be uh, properly over Microsoft Teams. Um, so um, watch the space. We'll be advertising it on Facebook um, so that you can join the classes from wherever you are in the world. Um, because normally they were just done here. But it's nice to be able to open it up. I've already done one class um, to a specific group and that work went well. It's funny how in some respects COVID has given us some opportunities yeah. um, for, for all the, the negative things it has brought. It's given us some some chances to, to do some things we haven't done before. Yeah. Um, so, yes, um, I always say to people, you know, we're not wanting things for Christmas or birthday anymore. Why not give somebody a family history research gift voucher um, because, you know, a lot of people are maybe not so interested in doing themselves, but would like it done for them. Mm -hmm. um, and while I'm talking about that, I can do these either one-to-one. Um, -one. Somebody could come in here and um, I can carry out research for them they, they have to pay by the hour. Um, or we can do it over Skype or Microsoft Teams. Or I can carry out the research and post them the results and um and one it does of my make an, an interesting it does make an interesting and unusual present doesn't it you've That's, had a lot yes. of people looking for yeah them. yeah before i um let you go <laughs> one final question which i have not spoken with you about um why why do you think this is an important job why is it in, um important for us to connect to our past or to the the, past, the people who came before us um, I suppose in a way, you know, and I, I mentioned before about walking in your ancestors' footsteps, a lot of people nowadays are moving around so much. And um, I think it's good for people to see where they've actually come from. Mm -hmm. um, and even just, you know, it, it sort of makes more sense when you go on holiday to these places as well. Um, it's like when, because my mother's family are from Skye, when I went to Skye on a holiday and well, my husband was saying he was trolling around graveyards the whole time, but it it's made it more personal actually going to these places as well, having found out the information and then going to these places. I would suggest, um, and it's and to some people it's a feeling of coming home, mm -hmm. um, different different reasons really, um, and I would just advocate it. Why not? <laughs> A, a, fas <laughs> a fascinating hobby and something that, that can be life changing. <laughs> Absolutely. You can't say more than that. I'm sure you can say the same for yourself when you looked into your family history. Oh, yeah. Or, or when I helped you. <laughs> yeah. But you can't take all the credit for that. Anne. No, I know. My you granddad started it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're right. And the finding out. Uh, and, and I am exactly the same. I have a particular address in London that a family stayed in for 100 years. And every time I go down to London, I, I go past that building because I feel a connection to knowing that they were there for such a long time. So I, yeah. I completely agree with you. <laughs> um, so good. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been really lovely. And I'm sure that people will be uh, responding and asking questions and 
if people want to join in the classes or contact us about gift vouchers, please just send us a message and I will either reply or I will pass them to Anne. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Okay.